In 1610, Galileo pointed his telescope at the planet Saturn, then the furthest known planet, and noticed that it sort of had ears. 400 years later, a little probe called Cassini finally looked back at us from behind those ears. Rings, of course, catching sight of Earth, a single bright pixel in a dark sky. But like the responsible child she is, Cassini still phones home every week to check in with proud but anxious parents. You know, if there's ever any problems, I worry about it. And I want to find out that everything is okay and say, call me and let me know how things are going. Or I'll just sort of look over everyone's shoulder as we work together to fix it. Besides breathtaking images of the sparkling rings, there was Saturn itself and a bizarre six-sided polar storm with a massive hurricane at its center. And the moons, 62 of them, including the most bizarre worlds in our solar system. Titan, with its choking atmosphere, hiding rivers and lakes of liquid methane. And Enceladus, its cracked ice surface spewing water, telling of oceans below. Oceans that could mean extraterrestrial life. And now, Cassini is braced for a grand finale. A series of dangerous dives between the innermost ring and Saturn. Headed for oblivion. She's the coolest, hottest, most complex, and most expensive probe we've ever sent out there into the wild blue yonder. Technically, in Federation terms, Cassini is a flagship-class NASA ESA ASI robotic spacecraft. Built and controlled by people from 17 nations. Before we shot her out to Saturn, all we had had were glimpses of the jewel of our solar system. Glimpses provided by the pioneers that flew past in 1979 and Voyagers 1 and 2 in 1981. But Cassini would be the first to get to Saturn and stay, and stay, and stay. Slated for a four-year mission, she just will not give up. And she's still out there, eight years after her expiration date. And the pictures she's sending back keep bringing scientists to tears. She's rewritten the textbooks about Saturn the rings, the moons, Titan. So many things have changed because of Cassini. The program is in, and liftoff of the Cassini spacecraft on a billion mile trek to Saturn. Her journey started on October 15, 1997, as a Titan 4B Centaur rocket tore into the night sky, bearing the precious bus-sized probe and slinging her into a crazy seven-year flight path. She went pinwheeling through the inner planets, starting with two loops around Venus, and once around Earth two years later. Then she hurtled through the asteroid belt and hooked up with the Galileo space probe at Jupiter in 2000 to tag team the solar system's largest planet for six months. Finally, in 2004, Cassini started sending back her first detailed pictures of Saturn as she made her approach, capturing two massive storms joining to become a single one, and snapping pictures of two new moons. Cassini then winged by the bizarre little Phoebe, probably a primordial rock from the birth of our solar system, snagged by Saturn's immense gravity. Then on the first day of July in 2004 came the most nerve-wracking, nail-biting part of the mission. Decades of planning, seven years of flying, and it all came down to this, firing her main engines to slow down, just enough to be captured by Saturn and put safely into orbit. Since it takes more than an hour to communicate with the craft at that distance, there was nothing her Earthlings could do if something went wrong. The slightest miscalculation would have sent Cassini spinning by, 
taking with her several billion dollars worth of hopes and breaking the hearts of her many human parents. Light up the rockets. Here we had to do a 96 minute burn to get Cassini safely into orbit. And I remember waiting and waiting, and of course, if an instrument doesn't work quite right, I worry about her. And part of the burn was when she was behind the planet. So we had to wait and wait and wait. The Doppler has flattened out. Finally, that signal came out, and it was just exactly on the plot. And we all applauded in such tremendous relief. Okay, we have burn complete here. Four years for this moment. <laughs> now began a decade of orbits, a tango of discovery, unlike anything any spacecraft had done before. Skimming Saturn's moons and rings and getting her dance partner ready for its close-up. Saturn itself was ablaze with storms of unimaginable force. The place crackled with giant lightning strikes. gorgeous aurora at the South Pole, created by its enormous magnetosphere, and invisible explosions of charged gases through that magnetosphere that Cassini made visible. This magnetic envelope of the planet and how it breathes continuously and how it rotates with the planet. So we have thousands of movies now of an environment that to our eyes is invisible. The rings were even more dazzling than any had imagined, stretching across hundreds of thousands of miles, yet sometimes only 10 feet thick. They're made of particles of pure water ice, some microscopic, some the size of mountains. We used to think of rings as these individual particles kind of bumping into each other and sort of floating around in space. And we now know that the bulk of Saturn's main rings, the particles actually stick together and they form these long strands that we call wakes and that these wakes line up like the rows of a marching band. They have grooves, if you like, like an old fashioned record created as wakes of moons which are orbiting. Some of them, the moons are in the rings. Some of those moons are outside the rings. And these waves give an interesting texture. They break apart and they reform. So there's this beautiful cosmic dance going on inside the rings. For the next eight months, Cassini whirled back and forth across an unimaginably beautiful spacescape. Then Cassini started arcing toward Titan, Saturn's largest moon, and the one that had long held scientists spellbound. All these years, Cassini had carried a hitchhiker with her, a little lander called Huygens, that was set to become the first probe to land on a moon other than our own. Because Titan had an atmosphere, and atmospheres have implications. This orbiter would carry a probe that would actually parachute down into the atmosphere of Titan, and we would have cameras, we'd have instruments to measure the temperature, pressure, composition, and then land for the first time on an icy moon. Titan has a really dense atmosphere, a denser atmosphere than here on Earth, nitrogen like here on Earth, but methane natural gas, which is being converted into complex organic molecules by sunlight and radiation. And the chemistry that's occurring in Titan's atmosphere today may resemble what Earth was like before life evolved and created the oxygen we all breathe. We want to understand when you have organic materials sitting on the surface 
of a moon for millions or perhaps billions of years, what's in there? On Christmas Eve, 2004, Cassini cut the apron strings on the little Huygens craft, the brainchild of the European Space Agency. Three weeks later, scientists around the world held their collective breaths as the little craft dropped toward Titan's surface. You could almost imagine if you're riding along with the probe, you go slam into the atmosphere of Titan, a giant parachute pops up, and now the heat shield falls away and your instruments are dangling there. And you're basically sort of sensing and smelling and measuring the atmosphere around you, and your cameras are looking around to the sides and looking down. We just saw more and more haze and fog and haze and haze until finally the probe broke through that haze and we got to see the surface of time for the first time. The surface of Titan was strangely familiar and utterly bizarre at the same time. The little craft seemed to have landed on the equivalent of a mud flat or shoreline with little ice pebbles scattered around. But on the negative 350 degree surface of Titan, these pebbles were made of methane ice. The nearby lake, a lake of methane. And then Cassini went into orbit around Titan and revealed with its radar system that there indeed are lakes of liquid natural gas and other molecules on the surface of Titan. They evaporate, just like here on Earth, create clouds of methane which rain back on the surface, creating rivers of liquid natural gas and lakes. Like water on Earth, that rain had cut channels and gullies in the moon's surface. But there were dry formations here too including dunes that stretched for miles and miles, reaching 100 meters high, and 3,000 meter mountains, suggesting tectonic forces at work here, similar to those on Earth. That methane, that gas that's in your stove, plays the same role on Titan that liquid water plays here on the Earth. You could have methane as a gas and form clouds, you could have methane rain that falls on the surface, and that's what created huge seas about the size of the Great Lakes on the Earth. Could there perhaps be some very interesting life in the lakes on Titan? After the long-anticipated excitement of Titan, Cassini headed for a close look at a tiny moon called Enceladus. No one thought this shimmering little ball of ice, barely 300 miles across, could rival Titan scientifically, but they were wrong. Its sparkling surface is ridged and cracked and seemingly scraped along its southern pole. Here, these strange blue cracks, dubbed tiger stripes, 75 miles long and hundreds of feet deep, resemble fault lines on Earth. The cracks were about to get stranger and far more thrilling. Cassini's thermal sensors picked up heat coming out of the ice ball, 200 degrees warmer than the rest of the planet. Enceladus is a small icy world in orbit around Saturn. It was, it's the whitest object in the solar system when we flew by it, and yet it has a lot of uh, geologic activity evident on its surface, so something was happening there. Pirouetting to take a look back at the crack silhouetted against the sun, Cassini captured giant jets of water, spewing hundreds of miles out into space from the tiger stripes. They shoot out at 1,200 miles per hour, vaporizing and then freezing. It was a stunning moment. It has this tidal forcing that's squeezed on it, kept the ocean a liquid, and what happens that's so neat at Enceladus is that there are actually four fractures at the South Pole and jets of this water and ice come squirting out into space. And we had no idea. Back on Earth, 
Cassini's stunned controllers quickly reprogrammed the probe to fly right through the jets, collecting particles. And what they found was even more stunning. Organic molecules, the basic building blocks of life. Because the geysers are erupting and they could guide the spacecraft very close, they could actually fly through it and look to see if there's water there, and there is water, and looking for the chemistry that's there. Enceladus is really special. It's giving us free samples. And so Cassini has multiple times flown through. You can imagine it's sniffing the gas and getting coated with these icy particles, and some of them come in and are sampled, and we know their composition. To our surprise, we found out that in looking at the particles, the ocean was salty. And it was salty and had a very similar pH to our own ocean here on the Earth. Here on Earth, wherever there's liquid water, whether it's deep in the ocean and very hot or in rocky places or in ice, there's microbial life. So it certainly suggests microbial life could have evolved on Enceladus because it has all the properties that the Earth had when life began here. And so if we go back with more sophisticated instruments, perhaps with the free samples, we could answer that question. Enceladus held another shocker for the scientists. Most of the water spewing out of its south pole falls back onto the planet's surface. When you could imagine standing on Enceladus, putting out your hand, and there'd be this gentle snow coming down all around you. But the fastest moving particles break away from the moon. But the very tiniest particles, things that are like smaller than the diameter of a human hair, they escape from Enceladus's gravity and they go on to form a ring called the E-ring. The indefatigable probe wrapped her original four-year mission in 2008. During the next two years, Cassini zipped past Titan 26 times and Enceladus seven times. Dione, Rhea, and Helene each got a single royal wave from the probe. It would be years later, in 2013, that Cassini flew behind the rings and looked back at Earth, our home planet, a single pixel in the vast solar system. Today, Cassini is still at it, making her whirling visits to moon after moon, ring after ring. And this year, she began a series of adjustments to take on one final spectacular mission, one that NASA, with the help of the public, dubbed the grand finale. In late 2016, the spacecraft began a daring set of orbits that took her high above Saturn's North Pole, flying just outside its narrow F-ring. Through the water-rich plume of Enceladus one more time. And then we'll hop the rings and dive between the planet and innermost ring. 22 times. They found that if we fly by Titan in just the right way, we can actually jump from just outside the rings all the way across the rings and dive through a gap in between the innermost ring and the top of the atmosphere. Now this gap is only a thousand miles wide and we're going to spend 22 orbits diving through the gap. Then, in a bittersweet finale in 2017, Cassini's NASA controllers will send the craft plunging into the maelstrom of the gas planet itself, guaranteeing that it will be incinerated and vaporized. They could have parked it in an orbit around the planet nearly indefinitely, but that would have involved an unacceptable risk. The probe could eventually get snagged in the gravity well of Titan or Enceladus, where extraterrestrial life may be getting a foothold. It's possible that despite all this time in space and the extreme conditions she has faced, little Cassini 
could have hardy earth microbes clinging to her. She'll be torn apart, a, a giant fireball going through in, in Saturn's atmosphere. And if you think about it, as she disintegrates and melts, her molecules will become part of Saturn. And so it'll be a very wonderful ending for this spacecraft. She studied Saturn, and her end is going to be with Saturn. It'll be a very sad moment. She isn't just, you know, bits of metal and wires and things. She's really the hopes and dreams of all of the scientists and engineers and all of the people who put her together. And so when I go and look at the night sky after the mission ends and I see Saturn, I'll see Cassini because she'll be there.